Right. Right. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I usually start this off with uh, asking, actually, if people here know what I'm talking about. So can I have a show of hands, who's used the VR headset? Good. This is good. This is going to be interesting, because I actually want to talk to some of you later. So yeah, um, UX, user experience in virtual reality and augmented reality has been a new thing. And it's, there's a lot of new developments in there, which I like, go across. So who am I? Uh, my name is Eugene. Um, I, I'm from the technical background. I'm studying computer science. Uh, I went straight into investment banking around the corner, I know. And, um, but then I decided, no, that wasn't for me, tech startups. Um, and having learned a lot of user experience stuff in there, how, mostly how not to do user experience, uh, which is um, why I've sort of decided, actually, you know what, I love hardware, so I'm going to go into hardware tech startups, and that's where I'm in now. Other, I mean, I'm a geek, so I'm, I'm a trustee of the London Hack Space, which is just up the road in Hackney Road. So if you're into playing with technology, uh, check them out because they're quite fun. Um, and just a members organization, just, just UXBA. Uh, and I generally love anything that involves digital to physical gateways. And by that I mean is you know, robotics, anything where you can affect the real world with just some digital data. So VR. Um, I know if you remember in the 90s we had a lot of development with likes of uh, Sega. Uh, they've developed a headset like the one you see on the left. Um, it used to be, uh, it was, as I was going to say, it was quite clunky. Uh, what the experience you had with it. Actually, has anybody here used any of the headsets from the 90s? There was one, perfect. And uh, hopefully you can, uh, can come with an experience of between uh, what it was then and what it was now. Um, and it was very limited. It was basically the way they portrayed it is like there's a TV in front of you and it's a big TV and it's 90 inch TV, that kind of thing. The resolution was really small and um, it was actually non completely non interactive. Then, come 2013, a hardware startup, um, Oculus Rift, uh, basically a few bunch of geeks essentially come together and it's like, okay, can we do a better job of this? And they have. And basically, it's literally just a bunch of geeks that came together, used a display from, I believe it was Samsung actually, just the phone displays that you have on your Galaxy, Galaxy phones, plugged it into a plastic headset and off they went, uh, started experimenting with technology. So where is this going? Um, based some uh, research, uh, market research by Digital Capital so said that in tw by 2020, so in five years time, the revenue from VR and AR fields is likely to be about $150 billion annually. So it is a, it's a rapidly growing market. Uh, in terms of um, the split between AR and VR, they think that most of the effort is going to go into AR, so augmented reality. But that, well, I should mention what it means for those who aren't aware. It's basically uh, stuff like Microsoft HoloLens, where you actually see the room in front of you, you see the people. And for example, in your case, I might have like all your Twitter tags or what you're tweeting that, uh, at, the, at the time you're tweeting. Whereas VR would be a totally virtual space where uh, I might be you know, in, on a beach in Hawaii talking to a bunch of dolphins. It's, it's, <laughs> that's the easiest way um, to separate them. And, uh, but yeah, most of the um, stuff for a augmented reality is actually in hardware. Microsoft HoloLens, uh, Google Glass is another one. Um, they've sort of, Google Glass have disappeared for a bit, but I'm pretty sure they're coming back with something um, interesting later on, as they usually do. And in terms of virtual reality, obviously the biggest market is games. And it's just, it offers the immersiveness, which is what you really need uh, to get games to sell. There are other, it's not just, but it's not just for games. There's, there's uh, film, there's a lot of other things like um, um, data, so visualization of data. I guess a lot of people have seen Minority Report and you remember the flicking with the, uh, all the data around, that kind of thing. Um, in terms of, sorry for the guys at the back, probably be hard to see, it's a bit low. Uh, what's on the market now? So there's uh, quite a few players out there and the biggest name, I guess, is Oculus. It's right around the center. So they offer content, hardware, and the software platforms. So they have their own content, but they also can they're happy for you to write, to write your um, packages around it. Um, so then, likewise, there's uh, other things. There's stuff like uh, Google Glass, uh, Google Cardboard, sorry. Has anybody played with Google Cardboard? So you've, yeah, there's a few people. And what it is is basically, um, forget all the high-tech gear, just basically, a cardboard cutout and 
with two lenses in, you basically slip your phone and you put it on, and you can get basic, what's called phone VR, it's using your phone for virtual reality. Now, what's happened, Samsung has taken that a step further and it's created the Gear VR, which is coming out in a week, actually. Um, and what it is is basically, if you've got a, a Samsung S6 or those sort of models or Note 5, they basically sell a headset for, I think, about just over 100 pounds, and you basically clip your phone in, and you have some controls, and, and you can do um, you can do some interesting stuff with it, with it. You can definitely do videos. You can move around environments, um, bumping into things, obviously, because you don't know where you look going. But I'll come back to that. So the problem um, is what we're used to using with computers. And most of the time, it's a keyboard and mouse. And the first thing when you have a headset on is that you realize you can actually see the keyboard or the mouse, uh, which is interesting. It usually involves in, in you sort of going, uh, tapping in front of you and actually trying to find uh, where the stuff is. And then, obviously, if you're not a touch typer, you struggle finding the keys. And there's, and that's not, I mean, we've had other things. We had um, approaches with solutions by main players. On the left is Oculus, and um, this didn't come out very well, but this is another big competitor is HTC Vive. And what they're basically aiming at, at is here, here's another way of doing things completely. So essentially what it is is uh, joysticks but the ones that uh, sense where you are in midair. So you have essentially two controls and you can go around, you can, you can sort of use it as a spray, um, spray can and sort of make 3D drawings with it. Similar to um, HTC Vive, they have a controller, about I said twice the size of something like this, and uh, which looks like a radio dome. It, they're really bulky, they're quite big. Um, but um, it's real. I had an exp about a week ago, I was using HTC Vive and so you're in this virtual room. I was in an office of the guys who built the VR um, application. And, and you, just in a normal office, I know I can hear everybody around the room because it's, uh, it was doing this hack, sp hack space. And, and all I could see is two controllers floating around. And it was the guy who was sort of trying to pass me the controllers without me going into him. And um, it was a really weird experience because although you can't see it, you can go and grab it simply because you know where in relation to you the controllers are. So uh, yeah, so these, that's the solutions that um, have been proposed and there are others, I'll come back to that. But the, the problem here is, is that you know, new hardware like this means that there's new user experiences you have to consider. People have to learn to use new things. And the feedback we got from HTC Vive was it was unnatural. And it, it was basically the, the user experience for that was you sort of hold, um, one of the controls, and you basically try and turn and basically select the menu you want by rotating the controller around. And it's definitely not something that you do on a daily basis. It's not, it's not natural, and it's something you have to learn. And um, yeah, but basically, as I said, for somebody who just picks it up, it's really hard to use. And that's what we found with um, playing around with the, one, the headsets out there already. So yeah, what do we use to address the problem in reality and we usually use our hands. I'm using mic, I'm controlling the slides using um, controller again in my hands. And may maybe later we'll get to brain computer interfaces but I think that's a few years off yet. But, um, and then why can't we take this and use it in the virtual world? And people have done that so, and I guess another question is how many of you have used a motion, uh, leap motion before? Perfect, it's still good, good uh, but I think Eight, ten people. And what a leap motion is, is just a small device that um, it tracks your hand by using video and computer vision algorithms to basically have a rough idea of where your hand is in space. Um, it, it's that, it does quite a good job. I mean, for something that's so small and so easy to use, you put it in front of your laptop, uh, in, basically in front of your laptop for your machine, or you can even put it on the new Oculus Rift that's coming out. Uh, actually, the one is out already and coming out in the next two months, hopefully. Um, you put it on the Rift and then you basically can see your hands in front of you, which you, it be, it's a simple thing, but it's actually a major um, aspect of being in virtual reality. If you can't see your own body, it gets weird. Uh, you, you, a lot of people get nauseous because you, you do this, you expect to see your hand and you expect the feedback from it, just the visual feedback. So uh, yeah, so at this point, I was hoping to, that this would actually show, um, for those who haven't experienced uh, what it's like with Leap, and it's basically what you can do with Leap and how basically you've gone around using your hands as an interface. 
whereas HTC Vive, as mentioned before, is using sort of like this weird uh, cross uh, select, selecting using uh, one hand, which is turning things around. But with Leap, what it does is, if you open your hand, for example, this way, it all your fingers become menus, uh, menu items, and you can scroll. With the other hand, you can sort of scroll through them and basically pick one. And that's that's the natural. Well, that's one of the ways um, basically developers found a way of making use of the device to actually give an interface um, to to control the environment. And that's all good. And I'm. Um, I was hoping to demo you a leap today, but unfortunately, it's kind of hard without like a sort of podium where you can put stuff on. But the main problem is that you probably have noticed is um, it's not quite. Um, it's, it's weird because you can't touch anything. So you basically you're going through something. You're like, oh wait, I'm going too far. So you're trying to find the point if you're trying to manipulate something because you can't see it, and just if it's in front of you, you have to manipulate, it and it's quite tricky. Now, and the problem with that is. A lot to do is feedback. As I just clicked that slide, I felt a solid click from the uh, remote, and that, that I was pretty confident this has this moved to the next slide. Now, the problem, of course, with something like Leap or similar is that it's kind of hard to do because you're in midair, and and that's and that's a big issue with the technology. And something we can either try and go around it by trying to find ways of um, finding like better user interfaces, or another option is, you know, why not use touch? Find a way of using touch. And basically, we learn everything. From the beginning, we learn everything through touch. We touch things around. We put them in our mouth as babies. And, um, but later on, we know mouse, keyboard, uh, the phone vibrating in your pocket. You know what it's doing because it's, it's touch experience. But can we have that for VR and AR? And well, that's what nah, I had the feedback, but I didn't actually quite yeah, so basically we're working on it, and myself and my business partner, Charles, we actually we're trying to, this is an early prototype of a device that allows you to do just that. Essentially, it's a glove that sits on top on your hand, and it knows where you are in virtual space, and a second you come into contact with something in, in virtual space, it stops your hand from moving. So you actually feel as if, as if you, and you can obviously manipulate it, and you're getting much better response, because it's not relying on visual input to actually find the data. So yes, yeah, so hardware is coming, but um, like before, it's the hardware is a very small part of the user experience. We need people basically to find how to make use of that and make make different apps with it and find better ways of using it, essentially, and basically to understand the field. And that's why this is a great crowd for people to actually talk to because you guys are at the forefront of user experience and it's interesting to see your inputs and how you can make this technology work both no, without touch or with touch, just because it's going to be a massive field and it's going to be a massive problem. Right, thank you, and uh, yeah, any questions? <laughs> no. Go on. Sorry, um, I'm going to apologize. I've got a lot of questions tonight, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I, I do apologize for that. But um, you, you obviously mentioned quite a lot about. Um, or bit like introducing virtual reality, interactual reality. Um, I watched a video a little while ago about Microsoft Halo. Yeah, uh, Hol HoloLens. Oh, yeah, that one, sorry. Um, Halo, watch the game. Um, anyway, <laughs> I just wanted to know your opinions on that and feedback on that because a lot of what I've seen from VR is to do a lot with like game, uh, gaming, uh, the gaming industry. I wanted to know if there was a, a break away from that. And, and um, gaming industry is easiest to enter because uh, gamers are the kind of people who spend 2,000 pounds on the machine to run their games. So because the technology is quite new, it's easier to push it towards them, I think, which is why a lot of big players um, push it towards it. But if you think of like, what's happening with the Oculus being bought out by Facebook, um, they're looking to looking more of like data visualization type, type tasks. So it's, it's, gaming is the obvious one, but there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff going around training. And we've, talking to a company, you basically want to try and use something like our, what we're working on uh, to train surgeons, because surgeons take a long time to train, but if you can actually simulate surger uh, surgery without having, obviously, a person to practice on for obvious reasons. Yeah. yeah you said the sort of that, that it stops your hand. Mm -hmm. So yeah. is that, ha ha sort of how does that work? Because it looked like it was just in your hand, but does it stop your whole arm? Really? No, it's specifically the hand. The, the, so the arm problem has been sort of solved to a certain degree. So um, 
there are other products there that, that can solve it, but the problem is touch, which is what you use to manipulate things most of the time. You can still see where it is in space, but yeah, you wouldn't feel gravity. I wouldn't be able to feel how heavy this is yet. Future maybe, it'll change, but it's developing technology and but it's a very good point. It doesn't have gravity feel. Yeah. Did you wanna? Oh, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a question in terms of like, accessibility, which is, it might be a bit ahead of its time because it's coming up um, quite a lot, and obviously in UX design on the web, yeah. um, obviously quite frequently, but in terms of VR, is that being introduced? So in regards to so is it, it, where she's looking at um, visually impaired people, um, is that something that's being addressed in, in VR? That's partly what we're trying to address with our thing, because basically you think about um, talking about seeds earlier and like you know, how plants look, and you could, we could take that and have a blind person be able to feel rough shape of that. We, we're working on tactile and specific textures, but with our, what we're working on, you could. You don't need the, the visual thing, because they work by touch anyway. But um, again, it's, it's new technology. It's, it's sort of, I mean, we're, trying, we're sort of pioneering that side of things. And we're hoping that that's gonna um, help that, a lot of that. And also people have, you know, in the future, partial paralysis, uh, we'll be able to sort of augment, um, if somebody has a stroke, they can move their fingers to a very small extent. We can augment it and actually they can wear it as a normal device to actually do things as they would normally. Is it, is it pneumatic? It looked like it had loads of air pipes. Uh, no, it's, it's actually using um, servos, uh, so very small servo motors. and. Uh, we found that uh, the servos that um, um, you can buy off the shelf are pretty bad, so we're making our own. And uh, Charles is, is uh, busy doing that, and he'll be doing that probably tomorrow all day. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk about how users, have you been testing this with users, and what have you? We've, the thing is, we've uh, prototype, um, there's only been tested by Charles, and that's because it's currently the, the proof of concept prototype is specifically fit, uh, was fitting for his hand. Which is one of the things we found out is like you know just tape changing is really is really tricky. So the version we're planning to bring out to the public is going to basically address a lot of those issues, and it should be we're aiming for it literally is a two-step process of putting it on, no need for straps or anything. And um, so yeah, we've, we've that's the kind of research we've done and talked to people about what is how important touch is to them in the virtual world. And I've when I was doing. Uh, just seeing how got people were using the HTC Vive last week, almost everybody, one of the first things is they, they try and touch something. Because that's, that's how you know you sort of, you're there. And, and right now, it's, you just you sort of fall through. And uh, that's, I think, once we get to the point, it'd be interesting to see just what people do and how they react. What software are you using? Like, do you use something kind of touch designer or? Software. Yeah, like behind the Oh, yeah. So uh, for moving the hand, we're using custom software. So basically, we're providing a, a layer on the computer that basically does all the maths, all the kinematics behind it. On how this stuff is being used is we, we work with Unity. And they're basically, they're game engines. Um, they're not just game engines, actually. They, they can make virtual reality worlds. And they're used a lot for digital installations and stuff. They allow it basically to simulate 3D objects. For us, it's really important to be able to have collision physics. So we need to figure that out. And a lot of packages, unfortunately, don't have the ability to do that. So, but again, as we push this out to developers, we are hoping that they'll actually find that new uses in new software. So because our API is going to be open, so um, anybody could potentially integrate with their software. I think that's all we have time for. Thank yes. you.